Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. The question comes up, when times get rough, should you be a martyr or a secret Christian? This is a rough one, okay? Because there is no right answer. That's the rough part. This one is up to the Lord to decide for your life what happens. And uh, it can be rough. Uh, study church history sometime. Uh, there were a lot of Christians, Christians down through the centuries have had to make the decision, am I going to just be bold and out and with it and everything else and do things that are contrary to the laws of the land and become a martyr? Or am I going to go underground and live that way? Not hide your Christianity as far as uh, pretend that you're a lost person or whatever else. No, just uh, you know, as a secret Christian, you're living for the Lord, but you're doing things kind of subversively, so to speak, we'll say. Okay, um, going out and putting out tracks, um, witnessing to people as you can. Going to get into this uh, in this study. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35 through 40. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. If you do get tortured, if you do get killed in the future, uh, you'll obtain a better resurrection. All right, You'll be rewarded greatly in heaven for dying for the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, this book is Hebrews. It's for Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, specifically written to them. And that's something they're going to have to decide. You go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you're either going to be killed, beheaded is one of the ways, and I think there is going to be torture in that time as well by the Catholic inquisitors that are coming back into full power as we speak. You're either going to get killed or you're going to have to become the ultimate survivalist, trying to survive when nature is falling apart. It's going to be something else. Verse 36 and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. Okay, so there you see the martyrs, but check this out. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should, be, should not be made perfect. But notice there, they are wandering about in the wilderness. Um, have there been Christians down through church history that chose to live out in the wilderness rather than to be in cities or populated areas where a lot of people would spot who they are and say, get them, take them to prison and torture them, get them to recant? Yeah, there were Christians that said, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to live a rough life being a secret Christian, being a survivor of this time. Revelation chapter 2. And that is going to be there in the future. Definitely. And again, you know, I've never ever taught that the catching up of the body of Christ is going to happen before any kind of persecution comes. Uh, you can see persecution coming. You can see laws starting to change and people starting to change. And it used to be Christians had kind of a respectable name in the community and whatever else. And now it's becoming antagonistic. Very much, you know, there should be laws. There should be laws against this, you know. I mean, I, I used to be, I'd see people and things and they'd see my, my magnets on my vehicle and they'd, you know, they'd wave or smile or thumbs up or something. And, and now a lot of times I'm getting people, they just they just glare at me or whatever, you know. And I know what they're thinking. I know. I've, I've dealt with people. Again, I don't, I don't record videos of me dealing with people out in public. All right? I do witness to people. I do talk to people about the Lord. And I've talked to these people, a lot of them, and they'll get angry. And they'll say, you know, don't you cram your beliefs down my throat. You know? But let's continue. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Again, uh, I've been back and forth with different brethren over this thing, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 through 3. Is this seven church, you know, is this church age doctrine or into the time of Jacob's trouble? 
And I really do believe firmly that it is, you know, uh, doctrine for the churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. Churches just means a called out assembly. It's not some kind of special thing. You know, dispensationalists make a big deal of the church age. Um, and I'm a dispensational preacher. But, you know, it's not technically correct because church just is a called out assembly. So there will be called out assemblies in the time of Jacob's trouble, certainly. But are people going to get martyred in that time period? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a ferocious time. And what's one of the reasons for that? Another one of the proofs of the time of Jacob's trouble, or the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching up with the body of Christ, uh, is there has to be a motivation. Why do people hate those that, that believe in Jesus Christ so much in that time period? Well, because when the catching up happens, we're going to be causing a lot of chaos and a lot of strife, and I do believe that children are going to be leaving with us. So we're going to get... Uh, we're going to be hated very much in that future time period, which I've talked about in many studies, so I'm not going to go over it again. But Romans chapter 8, you say, well, this is all for the time of Jacob's trouble, brother. We don't have to think about this now. It's all for the time of Jacob's trouble. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. This is rough stuff. You know, I, I read through these verses of Scripture, and I kind of say, well, you know, maybe there are some exceptions to this, and uh, you know. But history tells us this, that this is what happened. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that's some rough stuff there. It's good, you know, that we're not going to be separated from the love of God. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. But uh, verse 36, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You think to yourself, well, I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm born again. You know, I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ. Why on earth would bad things happen to me? They killed Jesus Christ. Are you better than Jesus Christ? They persecuted Him. They're going to persecute you. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto, vent, or unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, you can do that in most countries, okay? You can live as a Christian and you can be a nice person and whatever else and try to help people and things, and you should do that, certainly. If it's possible, live peaceably with all men. Sure. And, you know, that's one of the things that will really irritate lost people that hate Jesus Christ because if you are angry, if they're, if they're getting, you know, to you and things and pushing your buttons, so to speak, and you get mad and you yell at them and things, which... That's happened with me. I do get mad sometimes and, and things, and I've had to repent of that and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have lost my cool on that. But people get to me sometimes. But, you know, you have to get to a point where you realize, hey, these people are lost. i got to do what I can to try to witness to these people. And, you know, the best way to get to these people is to be nice to them and just preach the gospel, you know, and preach about sin and things like that, you know. So, not easy. But that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. But let's continue here. And uh, by the way, the passage there, um, God is going to repay them. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. I mean, let's just say somebody's down here and they're picking on you. They're, they're lying about you. They're, they're writing horrible, filthy things to you and, and just terrible stuff to you. Um, and they do that for five years. You say, oh, brother... Five years, you know, 
I mean, you know, I've been in this thing for 10 years now, full-time ministry, and the attacks that have come upon me have just been so ferocious sometimes. But what is that in eternity? I'll be with the Lord in heaven. Eternal life with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all my brothers and sisters in Christ. But what do they get? Eternal torment? You know, there's this whole thing of these, you know, a while back there, are these boys that were in the cave in Thailand or whatever it was, and, you know, they were down there for 10 days before they were found or something. 10 days is nothing. How about eternity? Pitch black and you're burning. They weren't burning. Let's continue. Acts chapter 9. So, well, brother, then I guess we all have to be martyred. I guess it's all just our, our fate. Our fate is sealed that we have to just die a torturous, terrible death. Not necessarily. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Um, churches, of course, Christians save people. It doesn't mean buildings were multiplied, that they were building more buildings or something. <laughs> Unless you're a Baptist, you know. That's part of the Baptism, I think, somewhere in there. But uh, it's not in the Bible, but it's in the Baptism. So that's a new term we've created. It's, it's not you know, copyrighted, so you can use it too. You know, Baptism. It's Baptist traditions that aren't, don't appear in Scripture. Baptism. It's good. <laughs> but the whole point is, brethren, when it, it doesn't have to be that you're being persecuted all the time or that every Christian is going to be persecuted and whatever else. You know, people will talk about horrible persecutions of Christians in Pakistan or, or other countries like that where it's Muslim majority in, in uh, Nigeria and things. You know, horrible persecution and things over in countries like that, and you know, and then and people come up, posties will come up with this thing. They'll say, "Well, they're being persecuted over there, so that means we all have to share in persecution um, some way." So that proves that the, the church is going to go through the tribulation. Uh, no, it doesn't prove that at all. Okay, during the Dark Ages, there were Christians that were living out in the mountains and places, the Waldensians and things. There were multiple generations that never saw any persecution. All right, uh, you can live peacefully in things. And what happens? The people were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied there. That's what we just read. And you know something? I've been thinking about that, and I've been thinking, what is it that will preserve things in this country? What is it that will preserve peace for us as Christians, Bible-believing Christians? Well, I would recommend walking in the fear of the Lord, sanctifying things out of your life that you know are wrong, don't hold on to sin, brethren. If you know that something is wrong, get it out of your life. Give the Lord a reason to preserve your life, in other words. I mean, unless you want to get martyred and just, you know, horrible stuff coming and things. Um, sanctifying your life is going to get God's protection. I'm not saying that you'll never suffer or never have anybody attack you or whatever else. You're, you're going to get some level of suffering, Okay. But national persecution of Christians, I think, you know, if we walk in the fear of the Lord and we uphold God's word as our standard, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, when I see a police officer drive by, I'm not worried in the least about police officers. I've, I've dealt with numerous police officers over the years and I reason with them and I've even quoted scripture to them and things and, 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 um, most police officers, uh, I'll either shake their hand or just say, thank you for what you're doing. You know, I appreciate the fact that, you know, the guy's getting called out in the middle of the night to go stop somebody that's on drugs or whatever else that's running around naked with a butcher knife or something. You know, uh, that's a job that other people don't want to do. But most people don't even think about that. You know, I mean, police officers go through a lot, especially nowadays. So, you know, don't get an attitude towards the police. All right? That's not of the Lord. I mean... Uh, you get, of course, there's corrupt cops out there and everything else. I understand that. But again, we're supposed to be peaceful people. We're supposed to be uh, people that, that the law should not look at and say, oh, man, oh, I don't trust those Christians and things. Walk in the fear of the Lord. I mean, our goals should be to live as sinless as possible, 
to get away from drunkenness, to get away from, to, to have no drugs in our lives and, and, and be good, upstanding, hardworking people. Isn't that what a country wants? Isn't that what the law wants? Can you live in an area as a Christian and be that kind of a Christian and not have to be martyred? Yeah. Countless Christians have. And yeah, you'll still have some kind of suffering in some, some way, shape, or form, but you don't have to just be in this whole thing and just, you know, oh, we're going to just get tortured, rounded up, and put in camps and whatever. That doesn't have to be there. But, you know, if you just live wickedly, well, then the Lord might let bad things happen to your country. But let's continue. Acts chapter 12. That's why lost people don't want Christians to preach against sin. Because inwardly, secretly, they have kind of an ulterior motive to not wanting sin preached against. They also know that when Christians, if they can get you into sin, and lost people will do that all the time. The number one job of you as a Christian is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ to go out there and preach to the lost world about their sins and convict them of their sins. And the number one job of a lost person is to get you to compromise and get into sin. They're, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. They are ambassadors for the world. That's why lost people can't stand the thought of repentance. They get all upset and say, oh, repent of sin, and they come up with all these little games and all these little mind tricks and everything else because they don't want to turn from sin. They love sin. Acts chapter 12, verse 12 through 17. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, Mary the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace. In other words, something to that effect probably. Um, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. What were those people doing? Did they have there at the, at the door, you know, at the, out on the street, First Baptist Church, you know, or something, you know, uh, you know, some big scripture thing on the front? No. They're meeting together in secret. And Peter didn't come and say, what are you doing? Are you hiding in here? You should be out preaching the word. You should be going door to door. Where are the souls that need to be won? What are you people doing hiding in a house? What is wrong with you? He didn't do that. They came out and they're going, Peter, Peter. He, you know, he's looking around and he goes, the Lord just broke me out of jail. Okay, I'm going to go over this way. Tell James and the brethren about it. Okay, okay I got to get going. All right, keep up the good work. Oh, but the high calling is to be martyred. Well, if that's a situation you find yourself in, you can't get out of it, but uh, there's nothing wrong with being a secret Christian. You know what I mean? The, might, the Lord might call you to an area where you can be in a remote kind of an area where you're not being confronted by the wicked lost world. He might, you know, he didn't say it a lot. Hey, I want you to stay there. I'm going to give you power to witness to those sodomites. I'm going to get you out there. You're going to have, you know, uh, first Sodom and Gomorrah Baptist Church, you know, or something. You know. No, he didn't say that. Hey, Lot, come on out of the city. Go out there to the mountains. Maybe that's the Lord's will for you. I don't know what the Lord's will is for me in the future. I don't know. I mean, my face is online enough and I've ticked off so many people. I'm sure there's a long list of people that want me dead, but uh, maybe the Lord will just kind of, you know, erase this ministry eventually and we're going to be living up here and producing DVDs or tracks or whatever else and getting them through the mail to brethren and distributing them locally or whatever. I don't know. I have no idea. But that's something you need to pray about. And your prayer should not be, Lord, I don't want to be martyred. Please don't ever let me be martyred. Let me be a secret Christian. Your prayer should be, whatever your will is, Lord. 
but try your best to keep things going as they are. Live in the fear of the Lord. Get sin out of your life. Say, so you know what? I don't want to compromise. I don't want to give the Lord a reason to punish me, to chasten me. I'd like to live in peace right up until the catching up. I'll tell you that. I don't ever want to have to be dragged off someplace and beheaded or, or some other horrible things happen to me or watch my son or my wife being tortured in front of me or something like this and saying, well, we'll obtain a better, better resurrection. If it happens, it happens. But you know what? I don't want that. I'd rather uh, live as a secret Christian if persecution comes. I'd like to be able to be someplace and uh, earn a living doing whatever. Again, you know, study church history. The Waldensians, a lot of times, they'd go down to, they would go to Vatican City in the Dark Ages as silk merchants. And they'd go down there and they'd say to people, they'd say, oh, see this beautiful fabric here, this beautiful silk and things? Did you ever think about how Jesus, you know, did you ever hear anything about how Jesus died for your sins? And the people would say, no, I, I never have. And they'd get a little witness in. Or the people would say, that's a very dangerous question to ask. Where did you hear such things? Oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I heard it one time and whatever. And just wondering if you knew anything about it. Okay, but anyways, we have a really good sale today on this fabric here. And they did that. Young men, before they could be barbes, uh, you know, kind of a, a elder in the church, they had to go on a missionary trip for two years in the dark ages. You know, and if you survive, you get to come back and, you know, teach and preach the Word of God. You've, you've earned, you know, your way, your keep, so to speak. And they would, you know, they'd make translations or, you know, copies of the Scriptures by hand, write it out, and they'd give it to people. Early tracting. Living as secret, secret Christians. Could you live as a secret Christian in a technological world of the future? Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about Christians going into the time of Jacob's trouble because we won't be there for that. But I'm saying... Is there something that you could do if things get really bad? They did it in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with it. But let's continue. Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 through 31. This is after Paul's been through trial and everything there, you know, going to Rome and, and all this other stuff. And years and years and years of... of you know, going through this thing of people trying to find him guilty and the Jews trying to kill him and everything else. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Hmm. But boy, I bet you Paul didn't think of that way when he was on trial. There before King Agrippa, and King Agrippa says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul says, I would that thou, not only thou, but all them that hear me today, were even as I am, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, except these bonds. He's down there bound in chains, handcuffed, you know, the prisoner. And he's probably in his mind, you know, they take him back to the cell, and he's sitting there in the dark cell and things, and, and he's probably just going, Wow, well, I guess uh, eventually I'm going to get killed here. Um, you know, and, and he hears the, the guards coming and things, and he's probably going, oh, here we go. Nearer, my God, to the... Oh, they walk by. Oh, okay. Well, um, excuse me, guard? The guard comes over, and Paul says, uh, for the sake of argument here, Paul says, uh, when's my trial again? Oh, we're still waiting on a date, Paul. Uh, we'll get back to you. And Paul's thinking, oh, no. I mean, you read this, the account in the book of Acts. It's, it's not just a few weeks or something he went through. It was years of him going through this whole trial period. And I'm sure at that time he was thinking to himself, I am done. I'm finished. I'm going to be going to be with the Lord. And, you know, you go through mixed emotions. You know, I've been close to death a few times myself as a Christian. And, and it just, and you're kind of going through things where you're going to be absent from the body, you know, Absent from the body, present with the Lord, you know, and, and to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But nevertheless, I have a wife and child I need to take care of. And you're going, uh, yeah, and you go through this whole thing. And 
you get to a point where all of a sudden you're down years down the road and you look back and you think, well, I used to think the ministry was going to end at that point in time. And yet here I am today, or yet here I am in some other place. And you know, you, you ever watch the news or you ever hear things that are going on and all of a sudden you're hearing, oh, you know, uh, they just, you know, the, this bad stuff is happening and they're going to ban the Bible in California or they're going to, they're going to do this or they're going to do that. And, oh no, this is not looking good for Christians. We don't know. That's why you pray for God's will in your life. Not my own will, but thine be done. Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to, to do? And you know, if it ever comes to a point in time when they say, okay, we, we've, you know, the Catholic Church is the one true faith, and if you're connected to the Catholic Church in some way, well, then you can continue. But uh, we're not going to allow King James-only people anymore. They've caused so much division. We're not going to allow that anymore. All right? And so, you know what? As a matter of fact, we need to confiscate all King James Bibles. Okay? And if you don't bring in your King James Bible, we're going to execute you. You say, oh, man, I better take it in. Uh what makes you think they wouldn't execute you when you bring it in, by the way? But, you know. Um, or you can say, you're not getting my King James Bible. Well, the police are going to come raid your house. Okay, well, then I'm going to hide them someplace else. Or I'm going to get a computer thing or something else. I'm going to put it on a, some kind of, I'm going to digitize it or whatever else and so I can print out a new one whenever I need one. You know, whatever. Hey, um, Things have happened here. I remember years and years ago, I said about the coming underground house church movement. I actually had a brother from Germany, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Lindenmeyer. He wrote me and he actually had written a little booklet on underground house churches. And, uh, and he was saying about how that, you know, what to do and whatever else. And I preached a sermon on it way back at Bible Believers Fellowship. And I was saying back then, you know, persecution's coming. And it, you know, we're talking probably what, 2009, maybe, or something. Here we are, 2018, you know, uh, things are still going okay. So live at peace. But the time could come when, you know, this movement might have to go underground. And, uh, you know, getting caught putting out gospel tracts or witnessing to people in public might get you in big trouble. Uh, you got to make that decision. You know, there might be a time when you'll be out someplace and somebody will say, uh, just man, my life is messed up and whatever else and things and and you're gonna have to look and say okay They could be some kind of a spy that's trying to get me and whatever I mean, that's what Paul did you know, back as Saul before he got saved He would do that, you know pretend that he was a Christian and he'd enter into the houses and hailing men and women and say Okay, come on in guards, you know get them Things get really tricky is the whole point I'm trying to make brethren things could get really really weird in the future and we could find ourselves being persecuted and at that point in time, you have a, a, two options, okay? Um, you can get tortured. And if you do, better resurrection, absent from the body, present with the Lord, okay? Um, even if it's a couple days or weeks or months or something of torture, uh, you'll get to go to be with the Lord. Um, Harlan Popoff, I remember seeing his video. He was in uh, um, Bulgaria, was it, or something, I think, uh, Russia, the Soviets basically took over, and uh, it wasn't Bulgaria. I forget where it was, but the whole point is, they put him in a concentration camp. And um, Richard Vermbrand, similar thing. He was in a concentration camp for years and years and years. And I remember they were torturing Popov, and they finally came in. And they put a gun to the back of his head, and they said, "You know, we're going to kill you. This is it." And they cocked the hammer, and he and Popov yelled, "Shoot me straight!" Remember his words: "Shoot me straight!" And, and, uh, and they took the gun and hit him on the back of the head and just laughed at him. And he said at that point, he said he was ready to die. And he just said, shoot me straight. Go on. I want to go to be with the Lord. And I bet you at that point in time when they hit him on the back of the head and he's laying there bleeding on the ground after being tortured for weeks and months and things, um, I bet you he thought at that point in time, I'm going to be killed for this. Years later, he's over preaching at Bible Baptist Church. It's where I heard the study, you know, thing. I, I have the video in my collection. Torn America preaching. Preaching to Christians, telling them about his tales of being tortured for Jesus Christ. It's really something. 
If persecution comes, seek the Lord's will. Okay? Maybe He wants you to go underground, have an underground house church. Maybe He wants you to just, you know, like with Peter there. I don't know. So I just wanted to put that out there. You seek the Lord's will in that time period is what I'm trying to say with this whole study. So that is going to be it. Uh, thank you to everybody out there that supports the ministry. And uh, we will certainly keep preaching the word until the Lord says, okay, do something else. And when I say do something else, it doesn't mean I'm going to be getting a secular job or whatever. The Lord's called me into ministry. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach His word uh, till the day I die. And um, in some capacity or another. And uh, so, but I'm open to His leading. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.